Hello, everybody, and welcome to our very first library event here on Crowdcast. So tonight, it is my great pleasure to welcome two authors as we officially launch virtual events for the Princeton Public Library. This event is a collaboration uh, with Labyrinth Books, our local independent bookstore that we work closely with on events all year round. Labyrinth and the Library will be hosting many events together here on Crowdcast in the coming months. Sometimes here on this library page, slash Princeton PL, and other times on Labyrinth's Crowdcast page. You should follow us both so you can keep up to date with what we have planned. We call these events Library and Labyrinth live streams or Labyrinth and Library live stream, depending on who is hosting. So make sure you follow us and keep up to date with what we're planning. We have some great things in the works. The best way to order books from Labyrinth is over the phone. The phone hours are uh, Tuesday to Saturday, 11 to 4, and the phone number is 609-497-1600 and then pound one. If you mention the live stream event that you tuned into it, you will get 10% off of Amy Jo's new book and Annika's books. All orders ship free right now. You can also do curbside pickup if you live locally. Uh, you will notice there's a link that will direct you to Labyrinth's website so that for easy remembrance of this. Um, once we bring our authors onto the webcast, we will get to mute the chat function that we're having fun in. We'll bring it back a little bit later. But we welcome you to ask your questions in the little uh, ask a question function. And we encourage you to upvote uh, the questions so that interest you the most so that when we moderate the questions at the end, we know what to ask. And now let's introduce our authors. They are close friends who write for very different audiences, but consider their friendship to be an essential part of their creative lives. Both authors live in Princeton, New Jersey, and have been discussing the ins and the outs of the writing and publishing process during monthly lunches for the past five years. First, I'm gonna bring up Amy Jo Burns. Now, let me just see, we need to do this, and let's bring up Amy. Ooh. Well, now this is my first time doing this. So here we go, let's bring Amy on. Okay. And we're gonna bring Anika on, here we go. Hi. <laughs> okay. Hello. We both made it, can you hear us? <laughs> here. Um, and ready to go. Hang on a moment. I just realized something. Okay. Hello. How are Hi. you guys? Doing? Hi. Thanks so much for having us. Yeah, thank you oh, for having us. We're so thrilled to have you here. So uh, I'd like to introduce Amy Jo Burns. Amy, you want to give a wave? Hi. Thanks for coming, everybody. <laughs> uh, she is the author of the memoir, Cinderland, and her debut novel, Shiner will be released from Riverhead Books on May 5th, not too long from now. So we had planned to have a launch event in person at the library, but this is gonna do for now. But one yeah. day we are gonna have our in-person event. We're determined on that because her book, Shiner, involves moonshine. And I understand she has been testing recipes for that. <laughs> on <Yeah>. <laughs> um, so Shiner has received starred reviews from Kirkus and Booklist and has been called an exceptional debut by best-selling author Jocelyn Jackson and a gorgeous novel by National Book Award winner Philip Clay. And having just finished it about a week ago myself from an advanced copy, I have to agree with those. It's a, it's a very atmospheric novel. It's so fascinating and so multifaceted and fascinating. Um, so welcome and um, so excited for your book to come out into this world. And Thanks. now I'm gonna welcome somebody who I've known personally for years, um, somebody who actually um, if I often walk out of my office, I will see sitting across in our lovely uh, glassed-in reading room, working away on her novels regularly and her writings. So welcome to this, uh, so yes, and a very well-known figure around town. So welcome Anika Moroz Risi, whose most recent picture book, Love, Sophia on the Moon, came out from Little Brown Books on March 31st, Yay. and there it is, and it's such a delight. Um, she is also the author of the Anna Banana chapter book series, 
the young adult novels for always forever maybe and nobody knows you which is going to come out in september so watch out for that uh, and then also other picture books like watch out for wolf and the teacher's pet uh, she plays fiddle and writes the lyrics for the band own lake and the tragic loves and has spent many years as a book editor before moving to princeton to write full-time so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to zip out of this conversation. I'm going to be sitting here moderating. I'm going to turn off the uh, little chat function over here so um, that we can all just pay attention to the conversation that's going to unfold. But again, feel free to ask questions in the ask a question box. And I'm going to let you guys take it away. You go. Thanks, Janie. Thank you, Janie. Thanks everyone who tuned in and thank yeah, you Princeton thank you. Public Library and Labyrinth Books for hosting us tonight. We're mm -hmm. really excited to be here on our couches and with you. Yeah. <laughs> um, we're going to start by just introducing ourselves and our most recent books. Um, and then we're going to have a conversation about those. And it's a continuation, like Janie said, of the conversations that we've been having together monthly for the past mm -hmm. many years. Um, Amy Jo is a crucial friend to talk about not only my life, but also my creative process, my creative struggles, um, all of those things. And we're gonna let you in on all of it. So <laughs> I am Anika Murath-Risi, and as Janie said, I write across age levels. I do write some essays for adults and lyrics for a country band, but most of what I write is for kids. Um, I write the Anna Banana chapter book series, which is about a kid named Anna and her wiener dog, Banana, and all of the ups and downs of having two best friends in elementary school. And I write young adult novels. Always Forever Maybe is a novel about toxic love and essential friendship that's out already. You can get it from Labyrinth. And <laughs> Nobody Knows But You is a thriller set um, in the aftermath of a summer camp murder that comes out in September. You can pre-order it from Labyrinth now. And I write picture books. Watch Out for Wolf, illustrated by Charles Santoso. The Teacher's Pet, illustrated by Zachariah Ohora. And most recently, Love Sophia on the Moon, illustrated by Mika Song, which is about a girl who gets put in a timeout. And when she gets out of the timeout, she packs her things and she runs away to the moon. And the first text in the book is that she writes her mother a letter that says, oops, should have prepared for that. It says, dear mom, I'm running away and won't ever come back. Don't try to stop me. From now on, I live on the moon. Love, Sophia. And she takes off in her rocket ship. And her mother writes back. So the whole story is told in letters between them and in Mika's beautiful art. Um, and I'm going to let Amy Jo talk about Sunderland and Shiner. And she's going to read to us from Shiner before we begin. Oh, and at the end, after we've talked, there's going to be time for your questions. So I see 15 questions already in the ask a question mm -hmm. thing. Add more as we go, as you think of them. And at the end, we'll be opening it up um, for that interactive portion. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you, Anika. This is uh, a real gift to me. So thank you, everybody, for tuning in. I also just want to give a plug for all of Anika's books, but in particular, this most recent one, my daughter, who's two, loves this book and uh, so loves Sophia on the Moon. And she'll say, uh, whenever we read it, she'll say, Miss Anika funny. So <laughs> you can't <laughs> ask for a better the compliment I've ever gotten. <laughs> Um, but anyway, yeah, so my name is Amy Jo Burns. Um, my first book, Cinderland, is a memoir. It came out in 2014. Um, it is sort of a stop time portrait of girlhood, and it also tells the story of a community that faces down a, a really uh, dividing crime and sort of the um, echoes of silence that continue after it happened. Um, and more recently, uh, Shiner is my first novel. Here's a picture of the beautiful cover. And I'm gonna read uh, just the first few pages. The first little section is called True Story that I wanted to share with you. But it is the story of a 15 year old girl named Wren who lives a very secluded life in the mountains of West Virginia with her parents. And her father is a local legend because he was once struck by lightning and became um, a preacher who, takes up serpents. And so when Wren witnesses him perform a really disturbing miracle that goes terribly wrong, um, all of her family secrets start to unravel. So that's sort of the, this, 
beginning of the book and then it's um, told from the perspective of three different narrators. One of course is Ren, the other is a reclusive housewife and then the third is a lovelorn moonshiner. And all those voices work together to tell the true story behind the legend of this man who was struck by lightning and really what happened to his wife. So I'll read um, just the first three pages here. True story. Making good moonshine isn't that different from telling a good story and no one tells a story like a woman. She knows that legends and liquor are best spun from the back of a pickup truck after nightfall, just as she knows to tell a story slowly the way whiskey drips through a sieve. Moonshine earned its name from spending its life concealed in the dark and no one understands that fate more than I do. Beyond these hills, my people are known for the kick in their liquor and the poverty in their hearts overdoses, opioids, unemployment. Folks prefer us this way, dumb mouthed with yellow teeth and cigarettes, dumb minded with carboys of whiskey and broken back Bibles. But that's not the real story. Here's what hides behind the beauty line along West Virginia's highways, a fear that God has forgotten us. We live in the wasteland that coal has built where trains eat miles of track, our men slip serpents through their fingers on Sunday mornings and pray for God to show himself while our wives wash their hus husbands underpants. Here's what hides behind my beauty line. My father wasn't just one of these men. He was the best. Since word of his sin spilled down the mountain, folks have split from the highway, hoping to catch a glimpse of a fallen hero. They believe that this miner's outpost shriveled since coal barons claimed it 40 years ago in the 1970s still holds the key to my father's miracles. Welcome to trap, the new sign outside city limits says. What it doesn't? Come here to fall in love. Come here to fear for your life. Strangers ask what I can tell them about the snake handler and his wife. They want myths and legends. They aren't tempted by the truth. It's a true story, I begin, roosting in the back of an old truck. I swear it. Then I tell them that these woods can turn eerie or romantic, depending on the company you keep. It's an autumn night and the fire is lit. Moonshiners sneak in their final runs of whiskey while young women like me tell old tales. The sun sets early. Along the outskirts of Trap, you'll find me standing in a constellation of four-wheel drive trucks in the woods behind the old saw wet motel. The mountains hover at my back. The story of the snake handler's daughter began when I just turned 15. I knew little then of the outside world my father kept from me. Ours is an oral civilization, I used to hear him say, and it's dying. He blamed coal, he blamed heroin, he never blamed himself. He thought he had the only tales worth telling, and he never understood what my mother had run from all her life because she'd been born a woman. The truth turns sour if it idles too long in our mouths. Stories like bottles of shine are meant to be given away. <laughs> I've read beyond that and yeah the whole book is not good <laughs> so let's start by talking about starting points um mm -hmm. you and I started our friendship yeah. um gosh more than six years ago because it was yeah. before Cinderland came mm -hmm. out it was before I moved to Princeton um we were set up on a blind date by the agent we shared at the time um who knew the importance of um close creative friendships and mm -hmm. thought we'd be a match and she was correct and I will ever be <laughs> <laughs> and I remember that first date we went to what was then Tivana in mm -hmm. Princeton um and sat for hours and I asked the question I always ask other writers, which is, what are you working on? Yeah. Um, and in the course of that, I remember six years ago, you mentioning to me a story, though I think it was one you might have put aside that involved snake handlers. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't know if that was Shiner or if that was a precursor to Shiner, but yeah. what was the first thing you knew about this story about Shiner? Um, what was the first thing you knew that would be in it? And what's something that surprised you about it along the way that you did not know would be included? So, you know, you're absolutely right. I have wanted to write about this for such a long time. I think the seeds for the the serpents thing were, were planted. Part of it is, is a personal thing. I grew up in um, a faith healing church in Western Pennsylvania, which is different from snake handling, but they carry a lot of the same traditions and beliefs and things like that. So it's it's something that 
I've always wanted to write about, but I wasn't sure I wanted to write distinctly about my own experience. Mm -hmm. um, but I'd read this wonderful book called Salvation on Sand Mountain. It's by Dennis Covington. And it's the true story of this journalist, Covington, who goes to Alabama to cover the story of a preacher who is convicted of murder because his wife dies from a snake bite. And um, the book is just so beautiful. I can't recommend it enough. But when I finished it, I really felt, I was left with this feeling like we know nothing about the wife. I mean, all we know of her is through her husband's sins and that's it. And I just feel like what a loss for us all. Um, so I, the seeds of this, that part of the story at least came from me imagining if she was gonna tell a story, what would she tell? Mm. So that was a piece of it. And then I think the huge surprise for me was that I would end up writing about moonshine and moonshine or I did not see that coming. <laughs> <laughs> but um, after I finished writing my memoir, um, I, which I loved writing, I had mm -hmm. such a wonderful experience writing my memoir, but publishing it was extremely difficult. Um, I'm not complaining. I, I think I signed up for it, but I just felt very exposed, you know? Mm -hmm. And when I finished it, I was three months pregnant in a high risk pregnancy. And I just remember feeling like, I want to hide, like I just want to hide. <laughs> and I was asking myself, do I have it in me to do this again? Can I write another book? And um, I came across all these stories of moonshiners that I feel like gave me that answer I was looking for. Just these people who are artists who are misunderstood and yet they're so faithful to their craft. Mm. I mean, they, day in, day out, they, get up you know they're they're up in the middle of the night they're this process it's so long you can't even determine when it really starts and when it ends they build their lives around their commitment to this craft that is so often misunderstood and i just felt though like the more i read about it it i got the answer they said there's nothing to it but to do it that's it and that's sort of where i began so i ended up merging the the story so yeah. Who knew that making moonshine and writing a book would be so similar? Yeah, that maybe that's why I feel a kinship. But mm -hmm. I'm trying to remember you were working, you had just sold Anna Banana, I think. At that I think point. when we first met. Yeah. So I was working on those books. And then it came as a surprise to me that I branched into older books and younger books. Mm -hmm. um, and um you know, I became a writer almost by accident. I was an editor yeah. first and had loved being an editor and in some ways started writing Anna Banana, which I considered to be an unpublishable book at the time because I wanted to um, practice some of the advice I'd been giving writers for years. I thought it would make me a better editor. Mm -hmm. um, and then I caught the bug and w wanted to know what I could do if I was not working on other people's projects and just focused on my own. And mm -hmm. um, that's how we ended up here. Um, but I tend to be working on several different projects at once, mm -hmm. um, which means a lot of them take a lot of time, but, yeah. um, but it's fun to go back and forth. I think the first thing I knew about Love, Sophia on the Moon, um, well, first I knew that there would be a character named Sophia because I'd written the Anna Banana series and I have a niece named Anna. And mm. I have another niece named Sophia. <laughs> and with Anna Wright, eight books in a series with a girl named Anna who even looks a lot like my niece mm. uh, without at least writing one book about the second sibling. As a younger yeah. sister myself, I understand that. And it was my yeah. very clever mom who pointed out, you need to write a Sophia book. And I knew immediately that a Sophia book would involve a lot of mischief because yeah. of Sophia. Um, <laughs> And it was inspired not only by my mischievous Sophia, um, who invents her own worlds and her own rules, but also by two clever moms um, in her life and in my life. One mm -hmm. is my mother, who has always been a smart mom, and the other is her mother, um, who is both very calm and um, very clever. And mm -hmm. this mom um, embodies those, those qualities as well. And in fact, I had seen from visiting their house um, instances when one of the girls would be frustrated or mm -hmm. upset about something or begging for something that they kept, she kept being said no to. And um, Erica, my sister-in-law would say, write a letter. And they would write out of their argument and emotions. And I thought that was very smart. So I stole yeah. that directly from her um, and then wrote a story about that. 
So, oh. um, nice tribute to the women in your life. <laughs> it ended up being that, <laughs> yeah. <it was> <laughs> So we talked a little bit about how Moonshine got into the story. And I know yeah. from knowing you that West Virginia has been part of your life for a long time where mm -hmm. the story is set. Um, one of the things I love about both of your books, um, the memoir of Sunderland and the novel Shiner is the incredible sense of place that you build. Um, the setting almost becomes a character of its own. And more than that, we get the sense that none of the characters or the real people in the case of the memoir would be who they are if it weren't for this place. We get such a sense of how the care, the, the, the place where the, the books are set um, infuse them and how the place becomes what it is because of these characters who live there. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. just from a craft perspective, how do you do that? How do you go about um, writing that sense of place? Um, mm -hmm. like, where does that start for you? Does that come in later drafts after you've got the story where you're putting in those details? Are those details early things to emerge for you? Mm -hmm. um, what's, can you tell me more about writing yeah. the settings for, yeah. for sure? So that is actually, in terms of my process, that's usually the first thing that I do. Mm -hmm. And I think, a big part of the reason why that is is because a lot of why I became a writer I think came out of me missing home mm -hmm. and trying to recreate a space not to replace what I had but to sort of give me space to grieve it if that makes sense um, I think when you feel like you've lost something your relationship to it changes and it's in that feeling that loss that I think we reach toward trying to describe something. So I'll start with some memory of something that I miss that, I'm, that I wanna recreate so that when I read it, I feel like I felt in that moment. So, um, which is is great for, you know, mood setting. It's terrible when you're trying to figure out a plot. I mean, <laughs> plot is the hardest thing for me. I will have characters just sitting in West Virginia <laughs> You know, um, so it, but I mean, I guess when you think about it, it's really that, that mirrors life, right? We, we get, we, it takes time to sort of reflect the environment that you live in. So um, I usually start with mood and with memory, and then I just go from there. And that's why it's such a circuitous process. I mean, I don't know up from down. All I know is that there's something that I feel like I loved and I lost and I want to try to capture it is where I start, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. What do you see when you're writing? I know writers mm -hmm. who see the whole book as a movie. Mm -hmm. I know writers who, I'm, I'm one who sees more almost like the architectural plans. I see the layout mm -hmm. of the house, but I don't see it really built. I see gestures of the people, but I can't see their faces. Mm -hmm. um, are you envisioning that landscape as you're writing it and the people in it or? Are, yeah, you know, um, you know I actually didn't realize this until recently. Somebody who who read Shiner, actually, two people, two different people, told me they read it and felt like they had were listening to a folk song. And when they oh, said I that, that, I said, "Oh, that's what I'm doing." So I actually don't see that much. I think I'm hearing something yeah. like some sort of melody. So I will know when the story is right when I feel like, "Oh, I I feel some sort of melody in my head," which I I feel like sounds weird and. I wish um, I wish I could see the architecture of something. I just can't. I mean, even now I look at it and I'm like, what is that? That <laughs> description I, makes so much sense though, having yeah. read a lot, so much of your writing that uh, you know, you when you separate the music from the lyrics in a song, it's right, something yeah. different. And, and the, your, the settings of your your books really do are play as important a role as the notes in a song do. Um, mm -hmm. So that makes absolute sense now that you've said it even though my brain doesn't work that way. <laughs> Which is, I think that's actually a really important reason why we have such great conversations, not just about, you know, life, but about craft is that um, I really appreciate, you know, how, how you approach when you write your drafts and you're kind of, you know, thinking through your ideas and stuff because I'm, um, I come at it from a different way, you know, so I feel like I can like learn from you and take it, like teach me, teach me. Teach well, me same. Me. And even what you were just saying about that you're, you start with the mood and the characters, I start with some piece of the plot usually. Mm -hmm. um, 
And from that, I figure out who would be the people involved in this plot. What do I know about the characters from how this, I know they're acting in this one moment and they build out from there. Mm -hmm. um, so it's almost an opposite approach. One thing I find so useful, besides that it's just fascinating to know how another author does it, is that when we discuss those things, um, it almost forces me to pull back the curtain on the magic of my own process yeah. to see what works, right? Because there's mm -hmm. so much about creating that it can feel like, oh, it just comes from above and when the lightning strikes, it's there. And when it's not, it's not my fault because there was no mm -hmm. lightning and no magic, which yeah. is not actually real. We have to sit yeah. down and do the work. And the more that I can understand what works for me in sitting down and doing the work, um, the better I can do it, the better I can force the magic to happen. Mm -hmm. um, so even just hearing you describe that, you know, saying you start with a mood and saying, oh, that's not how I work. Mm -hmm. It's useful <laughs> <laughs> to understanding what I am or I'm not doing. It's, it's yeah. part of what I get from from this friendship and the, mm -hmm. the back and forth. Or the moments where it does match what I'm doing is saying, oh, yeah. that's how that works. Mm -hmm. I didn't even realize <laughs> I was doing that. Mm -hmm. um, I want to go back to what you were just saying about grief, yeah, um, which is something that runs through both of your books strongly, um, mm -hmm. grief and secrets. Mm -hmm. And there, there are ways those seem very intermingled um, yeah. in some very explicit ways in the memoir, right? Because keeping those secrets can stop the people um, who were affected by the abuse from properly grieving it. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm curious whether that rings true to you that it also is running through your novel. Absolutely. I think um, processing grief is, I, I just feel like it's something that's so important to understand yourself and understanding the world around you. So it's not even something I, I think about. I think it's just something that comes out in my writing mm -hmm. because I am somebody who um, needs to process grief quite a bit before um, I'm able to even articulate what it is that I'm <laughs> feeling. So um, I just, I feel like so much of the way writers craft their books have to do with how you process difficult events. And, mm -hmm. and oftentimes, I, I mean, I don't know if you feel this way, but I feel like at least with both of those books, I gained something really important that I can take with me the rest of my life that I was working through at the time. I mean, with, mm -hmm. with Cinderland, it was like, I had to learn to let myself off the hook and forgive myself for something that was not my fault. And I had to learn to hold somebody else accountable for it. So a lot of what shows up on the page, I think is me wrestling with that. And um, the same is, is true, I think, in Shiner, but because it's not about me i was mm -hmm. sort of able to like reach to other players in a different way but i feel like you can't have joy in life if you're not also grieving things you know i don't know yeah, yeah. yes um that's interesting about fiction not being about you but there have to be these things that we took away from the process of creating the book right why yeah. sit down for all mm -hmm. of those hours over all of those months and years if there's not some big question you're trying to answer for yourself, yeah. even if it's not the same question that the characters are trying to answer. Mm -hmm. um, and I found, yeah, even writing chapter books for eight-year-olds, yeah. um, there needs to be some larger emotional issue that has resonance for me, a 40-year-old, um, yeah. that, I'm, that I'm exploring through that plot. And sometimes I know it pretty early going in, and sometimes I don't know until afterwards. So there's, there's, what we think we're writing about. There's the character's journeys and the questions that they're exploring or the the, the place that we want them to be. Um, and then there's what the book really is about. Yeah. Um, actually, it was in a conversation with you. We were having dinner and we were talking about um, somebody in my life who was very uncomfortable with um, the existence of anger. Mm -hmm. And as we were discussing that, I realized that Love, Sophia on the Moon which is about many things. It's about frustration and it's about mm -hmm. imagination and running away and coming back. And at its heart, it's really about unconditional love. But I realized in that conversation that we were having that I had written a book about the importance of allowing space for anger mm -hmm. in a loving relationship and really yeah. specifically the importance of allowing space for female anger yeah. in the world. That mm -hmm. was a draft 
I started oh, writing my book in so early that. 2017. <laughs> and I, you know, that was on my mind as we were having yeah. presidential inaugurations and such. And I, mm-hmm. I didn't realize that that was a, that was what that book really was about to me, the resonance um, until we were having, until we were having that conversation. Mm-hmm. Um, was Shiner secretly about <laughs> the thing that you didn't know? Um, yeah, I think it's about a lot of things. I mean, I think like I mentioned before, a piece of it was me really asking myself if I could put myself at risk again to kind of go through this process again, not knowing how it would turn out. And I also think I was wrestling with why men get to be heroes in the story and what the real cost of that is. What I didn't want to do was be like, women deserve their own story, so let's put her in there in a pair of cowboy boots and make her a bootlegger and things like that. Because really what you're doing is you're making a woman into a man to fit that mold of a man's story. So I wanted to really think through, like, what are we losing when we only listen to stories from a male point of view? And that every everything that came to mind for me is in the book as a as a result of that that question. I think that was something I was personally really working through um, as a new mother to two kids. I think mm-hmm. I asked myself that continually, like, what, what am I doing here? You know. So um, I think yeah. that comes through so strongly, even in just the first chapters of the book, we get a real sense of how this story would be different if men were telling it. Mm -hmm. Um, The first several chapters are narrated by a 15 year old girl, the daughter of the the snake handler preacher. And even the way that she tells her own story of, here's how you would see it from my dad, here's how I would hear it from my mom. We get the sense of those two different, of what's allowed in her life and and all of that. I, Mm -hmm. I love how that's spun. And I think what's important is that in telling those stories, it doesn't mean we exclude men Mm -hmm. or vilify men, because some of the questions I'm getting was like, we're like, well, if this is a book about women, why is one of your narrators a man? And it's because we love men. Men love us. That's it's not the it's not the point to be exclusionary, because that is the problem with the patriarchal myths that are out Mm -hmm. there now is it excludes women. So let's not, you know, make that same mistake. yeah. yeah, it's not at all a heavy handed message in the book. It's just something you notice as you're reading it because it feels so refreshing and different that that's, it's in there, it's present. Okay, oh, thank you. Um, I remember you saying, and I've also, I know you've also said this in other interviews that when you were um, publishing Cinderland, we've talked about fear, um, yeah. that um, your mentor and friend, I, I think it was Louise, said yeah. to you um, that if everyone liked the book, that meant you hadn't told the truth. Mm-hmm. And that um, we've talked about how you found that to be something of a relief in the process of publishing yes. a memoir of, okay, mm-hmm. if I if some people are mad at me and mad at the book, maybe it means I actually did something right in it. Mm-hmm. Um, and I can't help but notice that the first chapter of your novel yeah. <laughs> is called True Story. Mm-hmm. Um, and we, it talks right in there about um, the truth of what we, we spin. Um, and so I'm wondering if you feel like the same applies for fiction, that if everyone likes it, it means you weren't honest enough. Like, do you think about that at all as you're writing fiction or was it just the pure relief after writing a memoir of this gets to be maybe my emotions, but in someone else's story? Hmm. Um, I think, think it's hard for me to compare the two store the two because i just feel like they're such different endeavors if that makes sense um what i wanted to accomplish with my memoir in terms of truth telling and um i i think if you've written a story everybody likes um it might be a little boring. I don't, I don't know. I don't know if you if you feel that way, but yeah. um, I do. I think um, there's no there's a difference between facts and truth. And I think in um, in Shiner, I got to delve a little bit more into like what does the truth look like from this perspective, in this perspective, in this perspective. Where in um, my memoir, it was sort of like this is what is true to me. 
and and that's kind of it so i think what is cool about fiction and the truth is that you can sort of spin it and get a a more full-bodied picture of of what the truth is but mm -hmm. i'm actually curious to hear what you think about that um because I think I was playing with that li line between what is truth and what is legend in the first, in those first few pages. So, yeah. Um, yeah. What do you think? Um, I mean, when you were saying that there's no joy without grief, yeah, this feels similar to me that, um, um, that without discomfort. Yeah. <laughs> Whereas there's no emotional resonance of, of truth and, and the comfort that that brings. Mm -hmm. um, and that, I mean, talking about women's stories, um, a lot of what there is to be told in our voices is the story of things that maybe are uncomfortable to the broader world. And that's why yeah. those stories have been um, hidden mm -hmm. or less welcome and amplified mm -hmm. um, over history. Yeah. Um, Do you know, yeah now that we're talking about it, I don't know if I ever explicitly made this connection before, but I think, you know, I'd mentioned before that publishing my, my memoir was difficult for a lot of reasons. And I think one of the mm -hmm. reasons it was difficult was that I had used a lot of facts from the case in, in the mm -hmm. book. Itself. And to me, they were indisputable, but then I had people, I, I, in my mind, I thought this is true. And then I had people say to me, it's not true. Yeah. And I think that really messed with my equilibrium, not even as a writer, I think just as a human. Yeah. And um, I th think what I tried to do from that point is turn to my art and my artistic practice of writing and try to process what, what that means you know what does it mean if i think it's true and somebody else doesn't so i think that the, the book is sort of this long uh exploration into that question mm -hmm. about what is what is true really yeah whereas in fiction we know we're not done if what the characters do and their motivations don't yet ring true to the reader yes right but that they're mm -hmm. then underdeveloped or not yet mm -hmm. earned um so that's where i tend to think more about truth as well yeah. when i'm revising especially yeah that's a good way to think about it i like that word earned yeah <laughs> yeah um we've talked about risk i feel like every conversation between writers eventually comes back to failure no nope. oh yeah <laughs> <laughs> i'm glad you brought that up because if you didn't i was going to <laughs> <laughs> um and and I know we both over the course of the six years we've known each other and the five years we've been getting together regularly, we've both yeah. started things to put them aside. I have a whole manuscript that I thought would be my next book that my <laughs> editor kindly said, what is this and why did you write it? Which are excellent questions that I yeah. didn't have great answers to at the time. So it is mm -hmm. not my next book. Um, do you want to just briefly, before we let Janie interrupt us, talk about yeah. the role that failure plays in your process? Yeah. I mean, what I wanted to say that I, I mean, really appreciate about our friendship is, is that I feel like you are there for me in the low lows when I don't want anybody else to see it. You have seen it and you haven't like recoiled, which is, um, a, I treasure that. But then also to celebrate those moments, you know, when the book sells, when you see the cover, I mean, things like that. Um, because I, I think the hardest and most important thing as a writer is learning to weather disappointment. Mm -hmm. And um, it's easy probably for anybody who's listening to say, oh, look at these, you know, women that they've, they've written books, you know, it's easy for them. It's not, I mean, it is failure after failure, after failure, after failure. And then all of a sudden you're like, oh, the book is done, you know? So <laughs> and, yeah. And having a friend who lets you in on her failures yeah. really helps you get through your own. Cause you know, when you have those personal failures, it feels like I'm the only one this has yes. happened to, and this is the mm -hmm. end. And, mm -hmm. but when you've you're seen somebody else's that, process, you're always yeah. asking yourself, is there, is this the end? Is this, is mm -hmm. it really going to end? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Hi, Jane. Oh, oh, we don't hear you. There we go. I'm back. Okay. 
there was a little delay there. So this has been such a fascinating conversation and I'm just watching all the questions pile up because you guys are just like, I can actually imagine your lunches and uh, <laughs> fabulous and your support of each other is just such a delight um, to witness. This has been a really great conversation, but I really want to make sure before our time is up that we get to um, answer some of these questions. So I'm going to read out some of the questions. Um, this one comes from Robin. Uh, Robin has a lot of questions. So we're going to. Hi, gonna Robin. Start with Thank you for tuning in. <laughs> um, this is for both of you. Uh, what keeps uh, you motivated to keep writing and the emotional process of writing? Are there any words of wisdom or quotations that you keep that you keep feeling you inspired and confident? I, I think what works for me is to approach writing as a process instead of a product. Like it's sort of this daily meditation that you use to quiet your mind and um, connect with yourself, connect with something deeper. And then from that flows everything else. Um, because when I start thinking about how long a book is, <laughs> and how, you know, that's when I get tripped up. But if I just sort of say, I'm going to, I'm going to be faithful, like those moonshiners in the middle of the night, and I'm just going to show up and treat it as a daily meditation. I think that's what helps me claw my way through it, maybe. Yeah, very small goals, mm -hmm. incremented one step at a time. And um, almost a foolish belief in the broader vision. Yes. <laughs> and even though it's not anything existing and not anything good as it exists along the way, that it eventually will be so brilliant, it will have to go out into the world. Yeah, you gotta believe. <laughs> Just so delusion uh -huh. combined with very practical small steps. You can't go wrong. <laughs> Yeah. So, and then we do have a question here, just for Amy Jo, um, yeah. about how long it took you to write uh, Shiner, mm -hmm. and um, you know, to me, yeah. So that's, that was just the question: How long did it take you to do that? Sure. I mean, there were a lot of stops and starts because, in kind of near the beginning, my memoir came out, and when you have a book come out, you kind of have a lot of various things to do. Um, and then I had two kids in the process of writing that book. So there was a lot of, you know, momentum, momentum, psh, momentum, momentum. Psh. So all told, it, it probably took me about four years with all those stops and starts. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I always wonder, um, you know, there's some really great authors out there that seem to be able to publish a book. Yeah. A, a novel, like a full length novel you know, annually or, or, or more frequently. I mean, I think of Joyce Carol Oates. I mean, <laughs> the, she is so prolific um, and I have all the respect for that, but I also, there's also other authors who take it much longer. So it is a, an interesting process. Um, okay, so here's another question. Um, and this one is from Kim. And she said that she loved Cinderland and cannot wait to receive her pre-ordered copy of Shiner. Aww. Thank you, Kim. <laughs> uh, let's know if, um, and this is a book plate to put in the books, and um, if that's going to be possible, a signed book plate, and that she wishes she had a little person to buy Sophia on the Moon because it sounds delightful. <laughs> if you know any moms, it's good for moms too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it is. I think it might be a good Mother's Day gift. <laughs> it is a good Mother's Day gift because I feel like as a mom and I read it, it gives me sort of this like, chance to be calm which i appreciate <laughs> and um i don't know if it's some of you if all of you heard but anika does have a, a ya coming out in november that is going to be i think gr a great crossover so um just wanted to mention that but in terms of book plates um i think i'm getting some in the mail i don't know how many so kim I will message you when I get that figured out with my wonderful publicist, Maisie, who is amazing. Hi, Maisie. So <laughs> let me just ask her. <laughs> and and um, so I don't want to overpromise just in case, but if not, I can find something to send you. So no worries there. I'll, I'll touch base with you. Okay. And then uh, from Emily, Emily wants to know, um, Amy, since your stories often deal with young women and coming yeah. of age, um, are you ever considering writing a YA? And um, Mika, are you uh, considering writing a novel for an adult? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm. I'm interested. I've. 
the stories themselves choose what their audience is, right? Mm -hmm. the, the story um, wants to be told in a certain way and almost how it's published, what section of the bookstore it goes into is almost a, a part of the final touches and the marketing concerns. Um, so I hope to write a lot of stories over my life and I enjoy writing essays for grownups um, and song lyrics for grownups. Um, so I can imagine one day writing something for grownups as well. But um, honestly, I, I like to follow challenges in my writing, um, mm -hmm. things that seem like so, something I don't know if I can do it yet. Um, mm -hmm. And currently writing good books for kids feels like more of a challenge to me than some of the adult book ideas. I tend to follow the kid ones because they scare me more. Mm -hmm. They, I feel like I'll learn more in the process. Um, writing for, especially picture books are really hard. <laughs> so it's, yeah. so I, I write for kids um, on purpose. Mm -hmm. um, I have a very similar answer. I, I try not to think about audience until it's absolutely necessary. Um, I don't know if that's good advice, but <laughs> um, so uh, I wouldn't uh, say it's out of the question. I do think it's harder though. I really do. I think, I think it's, um, I realize when I try to touch base with that, age group i think i'm i think i'm kind of out of touch so <laughs> um but you know hey you never know yeah i'm you never know okay this question's for nika um so this is from Lori, and she wants to know uh hear about uh oh it just disappeared i'm sure this is our first time doing this um <laughs> oh yes the, about the challenges associated with finding and working with a publisher assigned illustrator Oh, so for those who don't know, I used to think that when an author and an illustrator create a book together, they must get in the same room or at least discuss during and create it together. But that's not actually how it works, um, usually. Usually, an author writes the picture book, revises it with an editor. When the words are completely finished, then it goes to the illustrator who works without talking to the author, <laughs> talking to the art director, talking to the editor, and then once there's a draft of the illustrations that the publisher feels happy with, then they show them to the author. And the author still does not talk to the illustrator directly, but talks to the editor about if she has any concerns or um, or even about what she loves. They don't want the um, author saying to the illustrator, oh my goodness, it's perfect, if the publisher doesn't yet think it's perfect. Um, so that's part of the reason for that separation. Um, and for me, working with an illustrator is incredibly, joyful. Um, it's one of the best part of the process because it it's more than half the story in a picture book is the visual story. And as I'm writing the story, I'm trying to leave as much space for the illustrator as possible. I'm trying to include as few art notes, anything that doesn't need to go in the text, I leave it out of the text and I leave it up to the illustrator. And that has resulted in some wonderful surprises in my book. So my book, The Teacher's Pet, is about this a teacher. My, my favorite. <laughs> it's about a teacher who is so in love with the new class pet that he can't even see all the trouble it's causing, and the kids are going to have to step in to save the day. And in the text, Bruno, the new class pet, starts out as a tadpole. And when I read this book to kids, I say, "Who knows what a tadpole normally grows into? Normally, a frog, right? Right? You got it." So, but it was a complete surprise to me, the author of this book. I knew it would not, that Bruno, the tadpole, would not grow into a normal frog because Bruno eventually starts eating their markers and their scissors and their books. And a normal frog could not do that. But I did not know until I got the first round of sketches from Zach that Bruno, the class tadpole, would grow into a hippo. Mm -hmm. And it completely surprised me and completely delighted me. Um, and now it's hard to imagine this book not being about a frog, that, a tadpole that matches into a hippo. Um, but if I'd written an art note that it was an amphibious monster or something else like that, um, we wouldn't have resulted in those surprises. And when Love, Sophia on the Moon, um, same thing. I left a lot of space. There's a character named Mr. Wubbles that goes to the moon with Sophia. And I didn't say what Mr. Wubbles would be. Mr. Wubbles turns out to be an adorable cat mm -hmm. um, who goes along with Sophia to the moon. But Mr. Wubbles could have been another kind of pet, an imaginary friend, a stuffed animal, um, many different things. There's um, someone they meet on the moon named Fergbert. And I don't say anything about what Fergbert's going to be. 
Um, so that too is completely up to the illustrator. That's for we're right here. Um, mm -hmm. So it's such a joy to see what the surprises are going to be. Um, and if if there were something that were to come up in the illustrations that would, I would think would not go well in the book, I could say so to the editor, but I really haven't had that come up because the visual story is the illustrators to tell and that's part of the joy of the collaboration of the surprises that come up in it, so. Well, I think you've been incredibly fortunate. The illustrators that you've worked with are just, you know. I've had amazing luck with being assigned wonderful illustrators. Yeah. And the publisher does um, include the author in that process of saying, what do you think of this artist? And, and it, um, it's been so, so wonderful when we have you at the Princeton Children's Book Festival that some of those same illustrators are there, you know, both for your books or for Amy Dykeman books, and we can mm -hmm. have you all in a row. That is an amazing event every year. There's so many incredible illustrators and authors. I want to spend the whole time going around getting everyone's signatures and books. So, yeah. I have to, to just give a plug for that. You know, my kids are five and two, and both of them have been able to meet their favorite authors at that mm -hmm. book fair. And I just, what an incredible gift to give your kid. You know, mm -hmm. it's, it's great and free. <laughs> yes, and it's September. Well, we hope it's September this year. It's. I mean, we're still, well, that's... All things. We'll see what happens with the world. <laughs> what happens with the world is a good way to put it. Um, okay, so here's a question from I'm not sure how to pronounce his name, Nariska. Uh, and what inspired you to both pursue writing as a career? Um, I had been working as a as an editor for many years, and part of what inspired me to become a writer was getting to work behind the scenes with so many incredibly talented authors and um, the tr that they trusted me with their earlier drafts and I got to see the imperfections and what was possible in improving them. Mm -hmm. um, and I've always loved stories. I've always loved making things up. I've always um, loved to tell stories and to hear stories. It's sort of like when a great song comes on the radio and you just want to dance and sing along. I feel mm -hmm. that way about a great story. It makes me want to be part of, um, of, of telling stories and making other people feel that way. Um, so I guess a combination of those things of seeing how the sausage is made and understanding that it's not just pure genius strikes from the sky, that there's a process you can work toward and getting the, you know, the um, privilege of being let in on other people's process made that seem more possible. Um, and then also just, the pure joy of of loving stories made me want to be part of it. Um, I think the truth is for me, I am a terrible multitasker. <laughs> I I mean I feel like pretty much every any job you have now you have to be able to juggle a lot of different things, and I hate it. What I love about writing is that you pick one thing and you dive in deep. I don't even like writing short stories. I want something that is going to be a years long commitment that I can just fall in love with um, and just focus on that one thing. You know, I, I think I have a kind of intense personality. That, <laughs> so I, I'm better able to sort of function in my regular life if I have that thing that I'm sort of focused on and, and uh, writing ended up being a good fit for that, I think. Uh, so here's a great question. Uh, Amy, can you tell us how you researched moonshine and snake handling? Sure. Like, did you research any interesting experiences or discoveries that happened along the way? Yeah, sure. Um, so um, with, you know, taking up serpents, uh, like I mentioned, I, I um, did ha grow up in a, a faith healing church, which is a term that no one I know uses. It's something outside people use to describe that. Um, so when I realized that actually, I started digging deep to just sort of see what had been written. And I found this great book. It's called the Foxfire Anthology. Um, and there are many of these books. Uh, this is the first of a series. I mean, they're still making them. There's 20, 30, there's so many. But what these books are is it's, high school students going into the mountains of Appalachia and doing oral interviews with people who were faith healers, are faith healers, make moonshine, plant by the signs, uh, make their own soap, all those things. So what you're getting is actual text and voices and things from people who do, do that. So there's no 
middle narration. It's completely just people talking. I have read so many of these and I love these books. So I always recommend them. They're just um, not only like a, a picture of, of what some things in Appalachia are like, but they're just, uh, it gives you sort of faith in what what humans can do. I mean, you know, I mean, moonshine, it's a miracle to me that you can, who figured out that you can put water and corn and sugar and you just let it sit and then you can get intoxicated from it. I mean, so <laughs> that's, that's what it is. <laughs> um, so I, uh, books like this that sort of had personal histories formed the beginning of my research. And then um, with, it, with regards to moonshine, um, I, like I mentioned, during the writing of this book, I was pregnant twice and nursing an infant twice. So I didn't have, I was not only sort of like stuck at home, but I couldn't really drink, obviously. <laughs> so I didn't get to try moonshine until kind of late in the process. Um, but that ended up working out great because I think what was important for the story I was I was telling wasn't how moonshine tasted, it's what moonshine represents to people who build their lives around it, what it, what it means to them to sort of commit to that way of life. Um, so I thought about that and I read a lot of oral histories about that, lots of documentaries. I mean, there's a lot of great stuff out there. Um, and then, um, when my son was about a year old, my husband and I went to visit a few distilleries in West Virginia and it was a blast. I loved it. I wish I could go back. I highly recommend it. Um, because what, what's great about going right to a distiller is that they're often making a pot in the back. You can, the person who's selling it to you is the person who's making it. So you can ask them all kinds of questions. This one man that I interviewed, we were there for a long time. He held my baby. He, I asked him all these questions and he was like, are you wanting to make your own moonshine? And I was like, no, no, no. <laughs> um, but there was just such a spirit of generosity and that has been my experience. So a mix of, books and a little bit of real life mixed in there too. Okay, so um, I've actually opened up the chat a little bit. We're getting near the end and so sometimes people like to leave comments near the end in the chat. And we're, we're gonna ask one or two more questions though before we close up. Uh, but I did notice that uh, Maisie Lim, who is yes. on the call with us is um, your publicist. She said yes. that she will set a place for anyone who pre-orders with Labyrinth tonight. Oh, thank so you, Maisie, thank you so much. Could you pre-order? So again, um, give, give Labyrinth a call, pre-order the book, they'll ship it to you for free, it'll come with a book plate, and best of all, you're helping a local independent bookstore who is really struggling in these times, and you know, we wanna keep our indie bookstores around. They mean so much to our communities, and um, Labyrinth means so much to Princeton, um, so yes. Um, so the book is really good. I've ordered three of them. Because <laughs> I'm yeah. giving it a gift. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> actually, this is something I've wondered myself. I never thought to ask. Do you kind of have? Do writers have like a reservoir of stories they want to write? Mm -hmm. And do you have a do you have a worry that that well will run dry? All the time. I mean, my husband, my wonderful husband, is here listening, and he's <laughs> laughing a little bit because I think five times a week I'm like, that's it. I had a good run. It's done now. <laughs> well, I'm the opposite. The ideas now? are the easy part. There's millions of them. It's finding the ones that will really uh. resonate and be worth <laughs> the time to put in. Well, Amy Joe, are you working on something right now? I am, yeah. Um, it's another story uh, about women, but it's um, it's about uh, a meteor that strikes the same town where a famous folk singer, female folk singer disappeared some years ago. And it's about how her past starts to intertwine with the life of a young woman who witnesses the meteor hit the ground. So it's about wow. women and, and the power of music and memory. Yeah. And so did you did you talk to Nika then about like fiddle playing and so forth? Because I mean that was going to. We're talking about our favorite country music too at our last dinner right before we got isolated. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we were discussing yeah. various documentaries and podcasts. That's right, we yeah. did. Yeah. So and Nika, how about you? Do you have a well of stories? Are you 
I do. I, I, I have a million ideas I want to do. And it's a matter of following the energy and figuring out which ones will um, have the lasting power. So my next book is um, Nobody Knows But You, the young adult thriller that comes out in September. And I'm currently doing revisions on my 2021 book, which is a collection of spooky middle grade short stories. Um, so for sort of eight to 12 year old scary stories. Um, so now you're going to have event as well. You're going to have picture book to YA covered. You got picture book mm -hmm. with the, the, the pre-k to k set kind of area mm -hmm. and then you've got anna banana which is like really early elementary yeah you know, you know, you know, yeah wow so if you want to book me for a school visit i can speak to all ages yeah. <laughs> and we have a comment here i like this from tim nussbaumer saying moonshine and country music these are my people um, thank you yay. that is the incredible pastor of my church it was wonderful. So thank you, Pastor Tim. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I shouldn't have outed you. Like that. <laughs> um, a couple more questions here, and I really, I really, I really am overwhelmed with um, Robin and how. I mean, <laughs> for the entire interview, Robin. I'm so sorry we can't answer them all. No. Um, um, I will say, Robin, maybe when um, this horrible pandemic is over, we can get together with Anika, the three of us, and yeah. add it out, because I think that would be great. Yeah. So this is going to be the last one. Uh, so Amy, in your books, there, yeah. there's some good lines that just draw you in in that first chapter. I actually have some index cards where I've written down a few of them because they really struck me. But then, and this oh, is one of the lines you. that struck me as well, and Robin said it, everything changed when Ivy caught fire. <sighs> Can you talk a little bit about this tantalizing line mm -hmm. and strong image and wondering how and when this line came to you? Mm -hmm. So um, I had mentioned that my writing process is, I mean, my mentor and friend Louise called it miasmic. It's it bananas. I mean, you know, if you were to, where I start is never where I end up. And, and that's why it's exciting for me. And I, I enjoy working that way, but, I have realized one of the ways that I work is I will write a whole bunch of things and they're sort of patchwork. And then it's sort of like making a quilt. Like, you know, you get all these individual pieces and then you sort of start to move them around to sort of see if there's a pattern or when you step back something larger that emerges. And that's kind of how I determine what the plot is. But what happens when I do that is that there's no transitional material. So if somebody reads it, you know, like my wonderful agent, it's kind of like, how do we get from here to here? And I'll be like, oh, so that line is a transitional line that I had to put in close to the end of the process when I realized like, oh, nobody knows like what is happening here. So sometimes I have to remind myself, like sometimes you just have to say everything changed when Ivy caught fire. Like, you know, <laughs> don't make it too hard for people. <laughs> so um, I think some of those things come pretty late in the process for me. Yeah, great. So um, we're getting close to our, oh, we are at our hour. I went by so fast. This is incredible. Uh, I think we could stay here for two hours. Everything has been so fascinating. And I want to thank, well, I really want to thank uh, you two for like being willing to go first on this new venture oh. in this, in this strange new world. Um, we had a, a fun time last night figuring out all the ins and outs and doing yeah. this. And the library is really excited. We have some more things coming up, including uh, next week is National Library Week, for those of you that don't know. So we're doing a lot of things. Um, so already up on our page is the event with Elaine Weiss for the Women's Hour, which is all about the suffragette movement. Uh, so it's a nonfiction book. It's important because it's the 100th anniversary of um, the women's right to vote being passed in the United States of America. So she's gonna talk about that. That's something we had planned to do in person before this all happened as well. And then um, on Friday, and I'm gonna get this put up as soon as we get off of here or, or, or first thing in the morning, um, we're gonna have Andre Velou on. And Andre is a local artist who um, does feminist art, but he does it, he's a, he's a, he's a he is, tagline is he for she he's a feminist artist and he does it in lego and he does portraits oh. so he's done michelle obama in lego and he's done um rbg in lego um and lady gaga um there are fabulous 
um, works. He also works a lot with children and, and shows them different ways that they can use Lego. So he's going to do a tour of his studio, which is just fascinating, and then show you his process for creation. So oh, we're trying to reach so out. Cool. Yeah. We have a few other author events in the works, but we're also going to try maybe to have some music on here with, oh. um, yeah. So solo artists, obviously we can't get a band together. Um, <laughs> unfortunately, unless they all live together. Uh, maybe there's, a, and, you know, we, yeah. Well, I guess maybe Jeff wants to come on and. Uh, we'll and ask do, him. <laughs> yeah. So yes, and there's lots of great things coming up. And also then you can go over to the Labyrinth Crowdcast page and see what they have coming up. And again, the library and the Labyrinth, we're working together, we're supporting each other through these times as we always have and always will. And so I want to thank Dortea from Labyrinth Books mm -hmm. for making this Yes, offer. thank you, Dortea. Yeah, she, she collaborated behind the scenes on this and for offering the 10% discount and the free shipping if you order from her. And now there's book plates for Amy Jo. And so, yay, that's a great, great thing to do. And I think we'll close off here you know, this is not like an in-person event where it just transitions because yeah. <laughs> it's so, yeah, we're all learning this together. Um, and if you so have further questions for us, comments. And so we'll see you all next week for National Library Week here on Crowdcast and uh, with our library events. And thank you both. It was it was yeah. fabulous. Thank you, thank Jamie. Thank you so much. Okay. And if you yeah, have further you. questions for us, you can find us both on Twitter and Instagram under yes, our name. Twitter, so Instagram, the, the continue the conversation there. as yeah. you would at a live event. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, everybody, yeah. for tuning in. Bye. Bye.